Okay, everybody, welcome. Happy Tuesday evening, and welcome to our monthly Edgar Casey on. This series tonight is on overcoming the earth and overcoming ourselves. This presentation is going to be enlightening in several ways. One is that we're going to have given to us the tools that we need to evolve out of here. But we're also going to come into a deeper understanding of how we got here and why we are here. And as you'll see, the journey to this point in time and the things that we do and are as people in a lot of ways regarding our personal habits and whatnot have their roots very, very far back in time. The presentation that we're going to be doing is based on my research. This is my interpretation of what I have found with the Casey readings. The sources are the readings themselves, some of the reports that go with them. And this is my interpretation thereof. You are, at all times, welcome to get into the readings yourselves because, as Casey did say, find that which resonates with you. If something doesn't resonate with you, then pass it up and go find something else that does. This happens to resonate with me. In a Casey reading, this one here, 3517, is an identifier for a subject who did receive a Casey reading. And the question posed to Mr. Casey in trance was, please give the origin of all this trouble. And he responded that it began about 35,000 years ago. Now, that may sound humorous on the surface, but it's meaningful in two ways. One, this was for a lady who was having lower back problems. So she was, the problems that she was experiencing has been with her for quite a while. It tells us that, in fact, there is reincarnation involved because there was a life body some 35,000 years ago that began having these problems. The second part of the meaning and the importance of this is that we can see that we carry forth things that were done to us, with us, for us, by us in previous lifetimes. It still carries forth. So we are always trying to conquer ourselves. To understand how we got here, you need to have a bit of an understanding of Casey's readings on creation. Creation, as we are told in the Bible, differs somewhat from what Casey said. It's not a tremendous difference, but a lot of it comes down into your interpretation of the Bible, meaning how are you looking at it? Is it a chronological order document, or how is it to be interpreted by you? A lot of what Casey did tell us, in fact, is in the Bible, but not necessarily is how we would interpret it being, meaning specifically that human life did not begin with Adam and Eve. Our origins here on this planet go back to about 12 million BC. And as the Bible does say, we were created in his image, which means we were in fact spirit beings. And as spirit beings, we are able to go into other various dimensions and create. And that's what we did. The uh, initial entry point was in the, um, over the continent of Lemuria, which is in the South Pacific, which is no longer there because it too has sunk. And about two million years later, there was some evolutions going on. And the things that we saw that in those first two million years was the actual potential, what would be called the fall because it was here that we started to use our creative powers, which we'll talk about here forthwith. 
and Casey termed this the second root race. The first root race was our initial soulful selves coming in at around 12 million BC and playing in God's playground. We did this for a couple million years. But as we started to do, and as you will see, we started to change. Our physical bodies started to become a little bit more dense. The reason for the density increase was because of disobedience. Now, the second root race was in play for quite a long time. And going through the annals of time, Casey does tell us that Atlantis had its first initial entrance into in the plane about 210,000 BC. Then at about 106,000 BC, we started into the third root race where our bodies became much more dense because what we're starting to do through disobedience, we were now becoming part of this creation here. We know that in 50,000 BC, there was the first sinking of Atlantis, it had three episodes of it. According to John Robertson's uh, research, Adam and Eve would have paid, came onto the scene at about 34,000 BC. And when you look at what's uh, the genealogical trace from Adam to Noah, it pretty much ties in there because Casey tells us that the great flood starring Noah was at about 28,000 BC. 14,000 BC was the final sinking of the continent of Atlantis. And then 12,000 BC is when the fourth root race came into play. Now, the root race, the fourth root race was these Adamic bodies created by Adam and Eve started in 34,000 BC, but it took that long to clear out all of the other monstrosities. Because as you'll see, we created a lot of thought forms and there was quite a bit of bad behavior on the world. Consequently, when you start to hear about things such as your mermaids and um, your satyrs and things of that, the Greek mythological characters of half human, half head, Casey said, indeed, that did happen. And it took that long to clear it out. I'll touch back on that in a little bit more. And then Exodus was about 1500 BC. Just give you a timeline of where we are with everything. So how did we get here? The soul of each individual is a portion then of the whole with the birthright of creative forces to become a co-creator with the Father and co-laborer with him. What that means is that we have God powers. When we were created, we had the same powers to create as God did. We had tapped into all the source of all knowledge because that's how each and every one of us were and the warrings of the heavens took place much longer, much before the uh, earth came into play. Consequently, we had all these souls running around creating in the universe. The reason that's important is because of this next one. Now, the 364 readings, if you'll note the number, 364 is the Atlantis readings. Casey did a series of 13 of them, and they're very informative. And if you're not familiar with it or haven't read it, I would suggest a strift drink before you get in there. But in the report of 364.13, which is the final one, it says God created the earth just as one may create a beautiful thought. Each part, each element sought only to magnify, glorify the creator. Peace and harmony reigned supreme in a harmonious expression of the great will. To this sphere, this strata of vibration, came one Amelius, son of the Most High, and with him came other souls, entities from other realms. So now, here we are 
in and around 12 million BC, and Amelius and the sons of God start to come on into play now. Now, if you think about this, and every element, we are made up of solids, of gas, of light. Have you ever seen a sunset or a sunrise that was just awesome? You know, you say, wow. It's the combination of those forces that because you went, ooh, they glorified God. Because everything on this earth is meant to, in fact, glorify God. Because it got a rise out of you, then it did its job. And that's everything. Is That's the main purpose. Okay. So now, continuing about Amelius. For he was the son of God made manifest that he might be the companion in a made world in material manifested things with the injunction to subdue all, bring all the material things under subjection by that ability to project itself in its way, knowing itself as given, to be a portion of itself, portion of the whole, in, through, of, and by the whole. The injunction was, keep thine self separate of that scene, but not that scene. That right there is why we're here. That right there is why we are here. What that means is this. Let's say you want to think about a dog. If you put in your mind a picture of a dog, you can make that dog run. You can make that dog jump, bark, roll over, do a variety of things in your mind, can you not? Yeah, certainly. At this time, the connection between the creator and the created was much stronger. Consequently, what Amelius was able to do was through what's termed, Casey called thought forms, was to create material beings. He looked around to see what God made on the earth, the different animals. And then he was able to basically create very similar things as he wanted. This is the power that we each all have as souls. But we haven't, we've fallen so far away, we've, we can't do that right now. But we're sneaking back up on it. And here's the problem. Keep thine self separate. Be of but not seen. What happened? was that the souls who were coming into the earth plane were able to create variety of thought forms. They seen what God created and they saw how they were able to use sensual interaction, meaning they saw things, they heard things, they tasted things. And the souls wanted to replicate that. They wanted to experience that. So what they did was that they were able to push themselves into their physical creations. It's at that point that they screwed up because now they were seen. They could be seen. By creating a thought form, they remained distant from it. But now, by pushing themselves into a material matter, they were in it. And then it was, it was all downhill after that. Amelius was endowed with the free will and the creative urge of the Father. He began to create companions, thought forms patterned after the creatures given life by God. These thought forms were projections from the soul mind. As they began to seek gratification of the senses, as did the physical creatures about them, they began to harden and seek physical forms through which become more conscious of the activity of the physical senses. So now, think about this for a moment. What physical sense would be of amusement to somebody who's never seen it before? How about sex? And this is what happened. They started to become gratified with it. They were going in and trying to gratify the senses. They saw stuff. They could use their power. 
And what we were seeing here is that this was a very, very dark time in the earth, very dark time. And this is how we got into ourselves today. We were in looking for sensual gratification. When we're looking for sensual gratification, it's all about me and we forget everybody else and we forget God. We were not glorifying God. We were glorifying ourselves by taking on that which we wanted. But this is what happened. This could potentially have been, might be termed the fall, even though it happened much before here. This is what was going on starting in around 10 million BC. Casey did give a reading for a lady once upon a time that said, to this day, the writings you made on a cave wall back 10 million years ago are still there. Because this is what was happening. We're becoming hardened beings. We went from pure spirit into a little bit more denser material. And this is, the more we went out for this to seek gratification, the more dense our bodies became because it was all about me and we forgot the loving matter of God and everybody else that we were sharing space with. This is also the beginning of lust because this is pre-Adam and Eve where it said that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wise of all which they chose. That's in the Bible, Genesis 6, 2. But this is actually going on pre-Adam and Eve because what we are starting to see is that the thought forms, everybody wanted to try it out. Everybody was going down here, trying to get gratified. And there was a very, very dark time in our world here. And when you think about it, the transition started to occur in the first root race, we were all spirits. Starting in the second spirits, when we started to have a little bit more denser bodies, we became more androgynous beings where we had both male and female sex acts, organs and stuff that we could partake with in order to gratify both sides, wanted to see it. And then that started to get more and more and more, but this is where this was going on much well before Adam and Eve. Lust was already in there. The sons of the creative force as manifest in their experience, looking upon those changed forms were the daughters of men and there crept in those pollutions of polluting themselves with those mixtures that brought contempt, hatred, bloodshed, and those that build for the desires of self without respects of others' freedom, others' wishes. The pollution was the mingling of the souls, the souls with the material objects, the souls pushing themselves into and having relations with other I am out there. And this is a very problematic area because now what happened? We started to delve deeper into selfish behavior. This is the beginning of contempt and hatred and bloodshed. And these were monstrosities. Casey just uses the term monstrosities, but it was very similar to what was going on in this time frame. Not necessarily the dinosaurs per se. Dinosaurs were eradicated probably around 65,000 BC and it was done according to Casey with a laser. Because what they did, it wasn't a asteroid or anything like that, but they used a, what we would call a laser beam and eradicated the food source. Consequently, they starved to death and died. But the problem is, reap what we sow. The beam that they were using was putting force back into the earth that had actually caused the destruction of Atlantis in 50,000 BC. So again, we got rid of one problem and created another. 
but this was the time that was very very dark now here recently just last month in fact there was a cave found in Indonesia and in it was depictions of creatures with a human head and animal bodies very similar to the satire and all the other animals of Greek mythology. Carbon dating from the Griffin University in Australia has it at about 44,000 BC, right in Casey's wheelhouse, right spot on. So what we're starting to find is that if they're dating this and it is accurate, then why would they do this? Why would they draw pictures of being such as that? Did they have a very vivid imagination? Were they smoking some really good stuff? Or was it something that was actually out there that they were able to see? What do artists do? Artists take something they see and they draw it. Let's think about the Great Sphinx for a moment. Man's head, lion's body. What does that mean? Lion is very, very strong, king of the jungle. The human mind infers reasoning, the ability to have a conscious mind. So why would the Egyptians build something like this? Well, let me ask you this. To whom do we build statues today? Don't we do it to presidents and military leaders and people who have, are upon high, so to speak, within the societal standards? Why would the Egyptians do anything different? So consequently, this leads me to believe that there was, at one time, roamed the earth, a sphinx. And by the way, there's supposed to be a second one down there. We only know of one right now. But this is what was going on. This, was, this is our history. And this is where our problems really, really began. Incomplete and unbalanced, these resulting creations and mixtures brought discord and inharmony. The magnification of any desire which seeks only selfish gratification must eventually bring upon its creator anguish and final destruction. That's telling us that if it's all about you, sunshine, you're going to gonna take it all the way to the grave because you'll end up killing yourself. Or how many people have died through the pursuit of fame and fortune and money? Mr. Schroeder gave us a very good example of several years ago about this gentleman and I'm not sure the time frame I want to say it was the 2008 crash but this gentleman had six something like six billion dollars and when 2008 came out he lost 60 percent of it so now he only got two billion he couldn't handle it he killed himself but what was the desire? He wanted more. More is better. He was looking to gratify things of the physical nature at the expense of things spiritual. Consequently, it cost him a lot of grief because obviously he just didn't wake up and say, okay, I'm going to do this. He, there was a lot of angst about losing $4 billion. And he ended up with his own personal final destruction. But that's what we have. This was going on hundreds of thousands of years ago. It goes on today. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Question put forth. Were the thought forms that were able to push themselves out of inhabited by souls or were they of the animal kingdom? Casey replied, that is created by that created of the animal kingdom, that created as by the creator with the soul. In other words, that created by God has a soul. That created by the creator 
is of the animal kingdom. So when these souls were pushing themselves out and making them, they were not making, these were not souls, these were animals. They were basically, that's how come we are considered animals. We are of the animal kingdom because we have animalistic desires. And this is what's going on. We have a soul. But back in the day when all of these monstrosities were being created, they were simply thought forms. They were not souls coming out, okay? Because they were of the animal kingdom because they were being created by the created. Now, whole world's darker than dark. Everything going to hell in a handbasket. Amelius realizes what's happened. He realized that the harmony had been overthrown through selfish gratification and abuse of creative power. So he took upon himself the burden of the world, the responsibility for the world. Now, Amelius would come back in many forms. One of them was Adam. The final go round was this guy called Jesus who took responsibility for this earth. Jesus, right? Isn't he referred to as the Savior? Amelius went through the whole motions. Amelius was going through everything, everything going on here. And so he stepped up to the plate. He was one of the first ones here that started creating. Oops. So he took it upon himself, said, well, time to get it back into gear here. Let's get you guys back to where it came. Now, what happened here became very problematic because as people were enjoying themselves through selfish gratification, when they died, as we said they would, and the spirits, the souls, went to leave, go back to the other playground, they got bored around here, they found out they couldn't get out. That's called soul entrapment. They were here, they could not go. They have forgotten from whom they came and were such, so disobedient to such a degree that they could not penetrate and leave. And that's where we are today. When you die, do you go to heaven? Or are you still kind of caught up in this realm in here? In limbo might be the term. And this is what we are starting to see. <clears throat> they were entrapped. And now they had to deal with it. But that's kind of just the background of how we got here. Okay. Now, at this point, we're still starting to come e evolve. All right, we're still evolving. This leads us into the biggest problem, which is usually staring back at you from the mirror. In the search for God readings, the question was posed to Casey, from what may anyone be saved? only from themselves, that is, their individual hell. They dig it with their own desires. The pursuit of self-gratification has a tendency of, for us to create our own personal hells. Right? I gotta have this person in my life. I gotta have this job. I gotta have this car, this house, this, this, and this. When it doesn't happen, then it creates grief with us. Now, first we would begin then at the beginnings, man's advent into materiality or into a material world and becoming as individual bodies of the world who became observing of this fact in the material world from that he man and woman saw in the earth. Now what were they seeing in the earth? All right. 
and now it started to come in. Because in the third root race, starting about 106,000 BC, this is where the souls started to split into male and female. Because this was part of the plan to be able to start to create a way of, for souls to actually escape. But what were people seeing? What were they doing back in that day that got their attention? Needless to say, it starts with S and ends in X. And it doesn't have an I in there. This has been the problem throughout man's experience or man's sojourn in the earth since taking bodily form with the attributes of the animal in which he had projected himself as a portion of that he might through the self gain that activity which was visualized to him in those relationships in the earth. One of the things that also occurred with lust was addiction because people desired to have this more and more and more. And this is where the selfish desires started the trampling of other people on their rights and whatnot. You know, whoever had the strongest outlook, they just took whatever they wanted and of them made wives of themselves, perhaps. And this is what we were seeing. This is what it was seeing. But this is the problem been throughout man's experience. He saw what the animals had and what they were doing, and he wanted some. He still does. He's still going after it. Still going after it. These influences that we have today, old as the hills. You can trace them back probably 10, 11 million years, maybe longer. Hence, slow has been the progress through the ages and has been seen and as may be gained by a study of man's development. This question of the causes of the relationships in those directions has ever been a problem before man. Sex is a big problem when it is used to satisfy the personal desires. And it ain't nothing new. It's been going on for quite a while. And this is what we're saying. Progress has been slow. Are we making progress? Yes, we are. We are making progress. Not as fast as some people may walk, but, you know, we are eternal beings. What else you got to do? All right? Sit on a cloud and play with your harp? So now, let's go back in and use some symbology from the Bible correlated with Casey. The apple, then, that desire for that which made the associations that bring carnal-minded influences of that brought as sex influence, known in a material world, and the partaking of the same is that which brought the influence in the lives of that in the symbol of the serpent that made for which creates the desire that may be only satisfied in gratification of carnal forces as partake of the world and its influence is about same rather than of the spiritual emanations from which it has its source will control, inability of will control, if we may put it in common parlance. So, what did we say? Well, we got Adam and Eve. We had the apple. Adam ate of the apple. What's the apple? Casey's telling us the apple is the desire to have sex. Who offered that the serpent. What is the serpent? The serpent is the gratification and the fulfillment of that sexual desire. That's where it came from. It wasn't, you know, the Adam and Eve thing. 
wasn't say, well, don't eat this tree here. It's simply a symbology that has to do with, per with personal desires. The inability to control ourselves. In other words, we will go forth and do that which we can because we can, without thinking of other people without thinking of God and without thinking of any other re repercussions that may occur of our actions. This is what's meant by the apple and the serpent. And you could use it in the sexual desire, but it could just as well be any other physical desire. It could be the pursuit of fame and fortune or whatever you so desire. We have a desire and then we have the fulfillment of it. And if it's made simply for personal gratification, you ain't doing it for the right reason. Morton Blumenthal's 31st reading. And the first was given man and the mind to subdue the earth in every element. As given, again, all manner of animal in the earth in the air under the sea has been tamed of man. Yet the man himself has not reached that wherein he may perfectly control himself, save making the will one with the creator as man makes the will of the animal one with his. We all been to sea world, we see the dolphins jump out and we see the little, you know, the otters clap their hands and sea lions, whatever, and everybody, you know, or, 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 whatever, right? We're making them do that, they do it on command. But God knows what's going on in the back room. We's in here, can't control ourselves. Do we still have rape, pillaging, and murder going on in this world today? We do. We had it 12 million years ago, too. Same song, second verse. We're still doing the same thing because we are not yet able to control ourselves. We can control everything else, but we can't control ourselves. There's your problem. There's your problem. This is ever and will ever be a question, a problem, until there is the greater spiritual awakening within man's experience that this phase biologically, sociologically, or even from the analogical experience must be as a stepping stone for the greater awakening and as the exercising of an influence in man's experience and the creative forces for the reproduction of the species rather than for the satisfying or gratifying of a biological urge within the individual that partakes or has partaken of the first causes of man's encasement and body in the earth. This was done in... 1920s, man, 1930s, 1940s. Ain't nothing changed. There it is. We out here banging it like a screen door in a hurricane trying to get our jollies. Now here's the thing which talks about the Adam and Eve thing, which brings us into the fourth root race, circa 12,000 B.C. In Egypt in and around that time, we had what Casey called the temple beautiful and the temple sacrifice. Temple sacrifice was basically what we'd call a hospital today. Very similar. Temple Beautiful was one of the, like a university or a something to that effect. Now, with the final destruction of Atlantis in 14,000 BC, there were still creatures that had tails and accessory, you know, other appendages running about. And it was in the temple sacrifice that they would go in and have those appendages surgically removed so as to be more normal because with the great flood, that got rid of a lot of the stuff that was going on, a lot of the, the monsters, the centaurs and things like that. Okay, Then it was in the temple beautiful where it was the training to be living the fruits of the spirits. And it was also in the Temple Beautiful where it was very artistic in that music came into play, dance came into play, and 
it was the fulfillment and the ideal of the whole fourth root race of our Adamic bodies that the people there would then use the reproduction mechanism in an up forth attempt to bring in a channel of God to here so that this person can have a chance to get rid of his karma and progress as well. The purpose of it is as an, as an expression of love with the ideal that you can use this method as a channel that God can put in another soul that was previously a muck like you. It's not supposed to be a recreational sport, not supposed to be trying to get style points or anything like that. You're supposed to be using it for the right reasons, which, as Casey says up here, this is ever and will ever be a problem until we have the greater spiritual awakening. Now, if you think back at the turn of the century, pornography was a $10 billion business. Today, it's racking up 120, 125 billion. It is. And so what does that say about us societally? Will ever be a problem until we get there. We ain't getting there yet, right? Now, think about what we have. What, what, did we, what was the development in the 60s that allowed people to partake of sex as they so desired? for gratification purposes, right? You had the birth control pill, right? But then fast forward here, last, you know, let's say the last 20 years, now we got little blue pills, right? Because the other guy, you know, you got to keep him going. Of course, they don't tell you to do that enough, you're going to have a heart attack, but that's fine. But now, and I mean, it's just Sunday, I, was, I saw something online, then I saw a darn, TV commercial, now they're using vibration to help create, to cure ED, erectile defunction, dysfunction. And now it's out there, hey, get back in the game. Everybody's being encouraged. All these outside influencers are saying, hey, get back in the game, right? You're supposed to be doing it. That's, what, that's the mindset that's being put forth. They are tailoring towards desires. That's the world we live in. That's what we've got going on. Content but not satisfied. Content in that have thy way, Lord. Use me as a channel. Not my will, but thine be done. That is content. Satisfied means gratified and is the beginning of the falling away for self is to be then glorified. If you go out, if you have a desire and you get what you want, are you satisfied? You sit down and let's say you're hungry, you have a big meal, shovel that puppy in, right? Sit back, I'm satisfied. I got what I wanted. Content is being happy with what you got. Content but not satisfied. Satisfied means gratified, which means you're putting yourself above. The Lord is going to give you what you have. Be happy with it. Be content and use that as a channel of love and expression. You know, one of the things that a lot of folks don't really realize is that life isn't necessarily always going to be easy. Casey's, as spiritual as he was and as much good as he did, they struggled mightily. They struggled mightily. They had a lot of financial problems. They didn't, they weren't, you know, always having food on the table. But they got by. And it was through a factor of faith. But content, but not satisfied. Okay? When we start to seek satisfaction, your gratification, we letting the apple and the serpent live rent free in our head. Because that's that's what we're going after it. That's what we're going after it. So shall it ever be 
that man's indwelling must recognize that not only must his desires be carnally crucified, carnally be crucified, but all elements that make up for the awareness of the spiritual manifestations in the material world. Now, what this is telling us is that we've got to learn to crucify our personal desires. If you take the pecking order of God, others, and self, we are on the bottom. We are on the bottom. We need to learn to put others before us. We may do so at not getting something that we would want. And when we do this and we live this type of lifestyle, then we are crucifying our desires. But we also need to learn to overcome the contributing sensory inputs. Think about how using eyes can lead to lustful thoughts. How could listening and hearing lead to gossip and things of that nature, the belittling of another? How can you know, our nose, the sense of smell, be used to invoke passion. Read Proverbs. It tells you about it there when the old lady's husband was gone for 30 days. All right? All of this comes together that not only do we have to crucify the desires, but all the contributing effects thereof. Okay? Not only the sexual desires, but all carnal desires. Be thou fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. Hence, Amelius, Adam, the first Adam, the last Adam, becomes then that that is given the power over the earth. And as in each soul, the first to be conquered is self. Then all things, conditions, and elements are subject unto that self. As in each soul, the first to be conquered is self. Consequently, when we look in the mirror in the mornings, guess what the problem is? It's staring back there at us. We've got to learn to conquer ourselves. We'll control, control ourselves. Okay. First Adam and the last Adam, that's what Jesus did through the lifetimes that he lived past Amelius. He's been to town, seen the elephant. This is why, because he be, did this, all things go through him. Because by doing this, by conquering himself, he's conquered, he's overcome the earth by overcoming himself. Now, he's able to do it. Think about, too, what Scripture says. Jesus spent 40 days out there in the desert, Right? And the devil come to visit him, it says. So you think the devil just popped up there with the little horns and the tail going on and talked to him? Or do you think it was more along the lines of mental debate that he was having with himself? Whereby he could, he understood that he had the world by its tail. And that he could use that which he had to glorify himself or he could use it to glorify God. That was the choice. And that 40-day battle, same thing that we all do. We all have that same battle. It is here where we are trying to learn to conquer ourselves. Now, this is an interesting one because this is from a letter that Gladys Davis wrote. And... It was in response to some questions, and I, I thought this was quite remarkable. She writes, He overcame the flesh, setting the pattern physically. Now we must all be purified, perhaps not by suffering on a physical cross as he did, but we each have our individual cross to bear, the cross meaning the laws we have disobeyed. For he, having fulfilled the law, became the law, the way, and there is no other. So we must crucify the flesh mentally as he did physically. It was necessary for him to do it physically because we had gotten so far from God we could not understand unless he set a definite material example in the flesh. No other way 
would have sufficed. And there you go. So the good news is you probably won't find yourself tacked to a board somewhere in some other lifetimes. But this is where we're going to have to overcome ourselves. We're going to fight these battles mentally. We're going to have to use the willpower and say, no, I don't want to look at this as enticing as it may be. I don't want to repeat any of this or whatever it is that we are doing. And by doing all of this, when he became the law, what did he do? He reconditioned himself to nothing but love, or is, is a God of unconditional love. What did he do? We see in the New Testament, example after example of him exhibiting unconditional love. And this is where we're going. And by doing this, he overcame it, and he is the law. God is love, love is law. Law is love, love is God. The Al Thornton mandate. Okay, so God has a plan, Stan. And this is the way it lays out for us. In the search for God materials, Casey said, what has been given as the truest of all that has ever been written in scripture? God does not will that any soul should perish, but man in his headstrongness hearkens oft to that which would separate him from his maker. God said, hey, come on back. We said, no, I want to go pursue selfish desires. And this is the same thing. This is the Old Testament. This is what we're seeing today. We have the ability to come in there. All we've got to do is want to. Want to and then do it. Want to and do it. This is how we're going to progress. It is we souls who turned our backs on God. God did not turn his back on us. We were out pursuing selfish desires. And as we did, we became more enamored with ourselves and we forgot who we brought to the dance or actually who brought us to the dance. And now we are in the position of relearning that. So, good news. Doors open. In another reading, Casey says, the only thing that separates man from his maker is man himself. So it's up to us. It's totally up to us. For when the souls of men had wandered away, he, not willing that any soul should perish, has prepared a way through which, by which, they each may find their way again to that companionship, that relationship with the creative forces. Hence, in each experience, again and again, the opportunities come for the manifesting that which is the ideal of each soul in the relationships with the fellow man. As to whether it becomes for weal or woe depends upon the manner of application of those that have been given as the fruits of the spirit of light, life, and immortality. Just being kind, just being patient, just showing brotherly love, just long-suffering. That's the recipe for getting out of here. Now think about what we learned earlier. Millions of years ago, it was very dark. We did whatever we wanted to whomever we wanted to because we could. Consequently, today, the path out of here is with the fellow man, each other. We've got to learn that it's not all about us. We need to know and recognize that we are all on a different page. We're all on a different path going back to the same place. Some of us are taking detours. Some of us are still wanting to follow the selfish desires. 
as opposed to another alternate route. But at the end of the day, that's fine. We're going to cross paths with these people, and it's going to be problematic oftentimes, but we're being counseled to be kind and patient and showing brotherly love and long-suffering, being good with it. Because that's the key. That is the key. And if you think about this, this is the reincarnation. Again and again, the opportunities come. That's reincarnation. And with respect to the fellow man, have you ever met people that you've crossed paths with and say, wow, I haven't seen you forever. I feel like I know you. And there's other people, I don't like you. Why is that? Because we have had dealings with them before. And so these are the things that we have got to overcome. This is part of the overcoming of ourselves. One of the things that the souls probably knew but forgot as they got in, engrossed in themselves was karmic law. That the law is, as from the beginning, that what ye sow, ye shall reap. The seed, the fruit of every act, of every deed, yeah, of every thought is within its own self. This is very, very, very important. This is a very far-reaching law, and it's universal law. It's not just per pertinent to this plane. It's pertinent to throughout creation. And this is the guard against free will misuse because whatever you put out is going to come back to you life's a big boomerang you know go out and do something to somebody else that's not fair or that's harmful it's coming back at you it's going to come back at you and then you're going to have to deal it deal with it and thoughts indeed are things so they count too so now here we are transitioning now. We are in the midst of the third root race where we saw that we had monstrosities. We had half people, half animal creatures running about, each functioning in society, not being very nice one to another. And that's where we are going with it next. The readings tell us that this is the transition into the Adamic bodies. Okay. From among the many physical shapes and sizes that resulted from the mixtures, he selected the form of the present man as the most suitable vehicle for physical manifestation on this planet. He then projected himself into five centers at once as Adam the first man, choosing the five necessary expressions because of the five physical senses to be conquered before spiritual consciousness could be reached. So though we may say that we have Adam and Eve, there was actually five Adams. And he put himself in there five at one time. Science is on the verge of discovering this. It's called quantum transpositioning. They are sneaking up on being able to put something into two places at the same time. I call it the mother effect because whatever I tried to do, you see, my mother always knew about it. So she had to be there, you see. So, but this is what is going on. This is how it's done. This is universal law, but we have fallen so far away from it that we've forgotten how to do it. But now we're learning that it can, in fact, be done because we're, start, we're starting to rejuvenate it. And here with Adam, it was five at once. Now, the key point about this, not only is the five Adams but as you will see, each ties to a race that we have today, and each ties to our gratifications, and they are correlated. And this is how Casey laid it out for us. 
are five races, black, brown, red, white, and yellow. Where did Adam put himself into in each of these? The black race emanated in Sudan and Africa. The brown race in Lemuria in the Andes, okay, South, South America. The red race, that was Atlantis, America. The white race was Carpathia, that's up in and around the Turkish region. And the yellow race was in the Gobi or Tibet area. Now, each of these ties into a physical sense. These are the things that we have got to overcome. We have five races and we have five physical senses that must be conquered, that we've got to learn to control. And this is how it came in. And as you can see, even today, and this is back, now we're back in a neighborhood of about 34,000 BC, we still have issues based on race today, don't we? We still have issues based on geographic location, don't we? We still have issues with our physical senses. Same song, second verse. Could get better, but gonna get worse. That's what we're over here to come. And this was the whole plan. Each of these are in different areas. To what were they to do? They were to populate the earth in and around these regions. And this was the whole, the tie-in of it. Consequently, when we see the various folks, we understand why they're here. Because the different regions, the pigment of the skin had to do with the region that they went into. And, you know, God pretty smart little cookie there. So, you know, he got people right. But again, man in his infinite wisdom looks for differences as opposed to similarities. And there we go. But this is straight out of the readings right there. So now, what you gonna do with all this? If you wanna get yourself going, you gotta take action. Casey was very adamant about doing something. Just don't sit there and do nothing, do something. Right, wrong, or indifferent, do something. Because it's here that you're gonna progress, you're gonna learn. Book three of Search for God. Question, will you each as individuals be led by the spirit of truth or will self, the own ego, the own material desire so outweigh that purpose? In other words, define who or what is your God. What is your ideal? Remember, the ego is not your amigo. And We've got to find and understand to have that conversation with ourselves as to what our God is. Are you seeking fame or fortune? Are you seeking things of material essence? Or are you looking more along the spiritual line? Because as it says, it's where the heart is. Mind is the builder. We're gonna get what we want but we gotta make sure it's for the right purposes because we know that if you potentially go after the wrong things of a material essence, it is not going to end well because it's the intent. Remember, every experience is a conditional one for choice must be made daily. We live in an environment of polarity we have day and night, we have good and bad. We have left and right, up and down. We have all of these opposites. We've got to learn to choose and apply our ideal. If our ideal is centered, if we know what our hearts are after, what we wanna do it and we're putting it into Christ, then we're gonna make the better choices because now we are looking for the betterment of others as opposed to the betterment of self. 
having the ideal enables us to go forward on a rep repetitive basis because every day and a multitude times per day, we're faced with a choice. Do I go left or do I go right? Do I wear the bright, you know, the red shirt or the blue shirt? All these choices. That's life. And we, if we don't know who we are, then we're not really focused. So we need to choose wisely, and by having an ideal that's centered with God, then we're going to pursue that avenue. And having an ideal will help us to go down there to remember it, to do it. Because if we remember it and it's on the forefront of our minds, then we are less apt to f stray down the avenue of personal desire. We're going to be aware of it. Say, hey, I don't want to go over that way. I want to go back over here. Damn it. And there we go. Do two wrongs make anything right? Have ye lived? Will ye and do ye live day by day as ye would that men should do to you? Do ye even so to them? This is the law. This is the ideal, not merely idealistic, but the way of life. In other words, live the golden rule. Right? Do you want to, how do you want to be treated? The way we treat each other is the way we treat God. But we've got to have these things in our minds. We've got to have a refresher because it's very, very easy to be swayed. And I would say more so today than it has ever been before in our timekeeping. Because what has technology done? It's bombarded us with all kinds of stuff. And we need help. We need to keep a way to keep our compass going to the true north. So we've got to always, always, always be on guard that things, in fact, do change. We're going to be, in, you know, enticed to do things that are maybe not going on. There is much more to be obtained from the right mental attitude respecting circumstances of either physical, mental, or spiritual than by the use of properties, things, or conditions outside of self unless these are in accord with the attitudes of the body. In other words, maintain a positive attitude. Now, we've all heard the adage that stuff happens. Somebody I know near and dear to me has a whole t-shirt of things that stuff happened and how to interpret that. But the question is going to be, how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to look to place blame elsewhere? Or are you going to just let it put up the the armor a little bit and let it deflect off of you. And this is what we really have got to remember is that the mind is the builder. It's very, very easy, and we see it today. There is a lot of victimhood out there. Everybody's a victim for this, that, or the other. But do we really take the time to ask ourselves, what could I have done to bring this to me? We need to. And it's don't. And what Casey is saying is maintain a good attitude. Everything is happening to you right now for a reason. There's no such thing as coincidence. Yeah, it may suck to be you right now, but there's a reason for that. And you've got to take it and say, okay, I trust you, Lord. I will overcome this. You know, Jesus in the garden, I mean, he wasn't real thrilled at the prospects, but he had to, you know, go with it. And he had to remember, said, hey, you're doing this for others. This is how you have to do it because this is going to reap the rewards thousands of years from now. It may not be so much right now, but it's what you need to do. We always got to maintain the proper perspective on things.
lives. Now, the mind is the builder. Very, very important. We've seen Casey's adage before that the spirit is the life, the mind is the builder, and the physical is the result. If we take the spirit is the life portion, and what is that? What is the spirit? What is the life? Is that the activative spiritual energy that we're dealing with? Is that the unconditional love of God? Is that the creative forces? Is that God himself saying, okay, you have the right to be a co-creator. And what are you going to do with it? Well, what did we just see? Choice must be made daily. You have choices. You can make loving choices or you can make spiritual or selfish choices. What are you going to do? What will the mind build? Loving choices are going to bring peace and harmony and heaven and love and things of that nature. Negative, selfish choices is going to bring death and animosity and war and hell and things of that nature. The mind is the builder. We're going to put it out there. So this is why maintaining the personal attitude is so important because it goes into and ties into the bigger picture of things. Now, the second part of this ties in to universal laws because we got to reap what we sow. And remember, what we put out will come back to us. So what do you want to be showered with? Do you want to be showered with peace, love, and happiness? Or do you want to have hell, day, you know, violence and animosity? What you put out, you're going to get back. No two ways about it. Universal law. It's not a matter of if. It's simply a matter of when. And it may not be this lifetime. Consequently, if some really bad things happen to you, and as it does to a lot of people, what did he do to deserve this is often a question. Well, if you're asked, Casey, you want to go back about three lifetimes and you know check out the 26th year. And boom, there's, you know, Johnny over there doing something he ain't supposed to do. But he's got to now meet it. So this is a very important part, this reaping what we're sowing. This is so such an important thing. And it's not only in actions, but it also has to do with inaction. By that, let's just say, like we want to do today, if we wanted to sit on the toe, uh, sit on the couch, eat potato chips, plays with our toes, and play video games, what's going to happen? What are we going to become? We're going to have health issues, aren't we? Because what are we not doing? We're not exercising. We're not doing the things that we need to be doing. So this pertains not only to the acts of commission, but acts of omission as well. Very powerful law that I wish I remembered many years ago. But I wouldn't have had the fun that I had. Anyhow, meditation is very important. In fact, in the Search for God books, oft analyze in self's own inner self the whys of those desires and hopes. Consider as to whether these are in keeping with the spiritual purposes. For while mind is the builder, it is the purpose, the intent, with which an individual applies self mentally that brings to those physical results into materiality. David Kahn. This is quite important because we like to BS ourselves a lot. And we need to have that un very uncomfortable conversation with ourselves as to why in the hell we're doing things that we do. And we got to get down to the nitty gritty. You know, as humans, we like to put things on the surface. We judge books by its covers and so on. But who knows what's in our hearts? God. God knows what's in our hearts. Consequently, it would behoove us to be very, very mindful of the intent of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. 
because it is the intent which we are putting forth. Why are we doing things? It is the intent that's going to come back to us. And we might, you know, power it over, you know, put a little lipstick on it and say, oh, I'm just doing this. But actually you're giving your neighbor the business there or something. It's going to come back to you. You got to be brutally honest with yourself and you may not like the answer. But it is what it is. Let this be the attitude in correcting the physical forces. That the corrections are for purposefulness towards the usefulness of self's abilities for others. Use your time, treasure, and talent for the benefit of other folks. We all have our own gifts. Some of us have treasures that we can give, and a lot of folks say it's just a lot easier to just write the check. But then again, we go back into the intent part and say, why am I doing that? Well, I don't want to go down and feed the homeless. I'll just write the check. Okay, is what it is. But you got to understand that you have these things. We all have skills. We should be able to look with purpose to do these things for the betterment of others. Because if not, if we are hoarding our time, treasure, and talent, then it's all about us. And then that crosses the line into selfishness. How y'all depend on looking at it, but that's what it is. We like, you know, a lot of times we like to play the conditional woulda, coulda, shoulda game with ourselves. And in a lot of ways, we'll go out and say, well, once I win the lottery, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Casey actually addressed that one time in a reading. And he said that you say you're going to do this and that, but you won't. People need today what you have today. There's a need out there. Don't wait for something to come to you before you give. Give and let it come back to you. He, he was pretty brutal with that one. That's what we need to think about. For to the entity, as to the world, patience is the lesson that each soul must learn in its sojourn through materiality. Now, we need to learn to be patient not only with others, but we also need to learn to be patient with ourselves and with God, believe it or not. The purpose of life is not to have an easy life. The purpose of life is to learn the lessons to overcome the previous disobedience that we have done. God will hear your prayers. He hears all our prayers, and he's going to answer them. It's going to be an answer of yes, no, or wait. Now, we, exhibiting patience, want everything right now, if not sooner. But patience is a very, very important lesson that we all are down here to learn. How many times in your lives, I can think of several myself, where I wanted something, I really wanted it, but I didn't get it. And then time goes by, evolves, things happen, things change. And then, wow, man, I'm glad I didn't get that. Anybody ever have that other than me? You wanted things so bad, but you didn't get it and you were kind of agitated about it? But then as time goes by, more cards are dealt, things unfolded, and it was really probably a good thing that you didn't get it? Yeah, yeah. But patience, you know, this is the content versus satisfied thing that we talked about earlier. You know, be a channel. So you, got, you, know, so you don't need this right now. Okay, I'll take what I got. But if you keep pursuing it, 
then you're going to start pushing the envelope. Through patience does the understanding come. Knowledge of itself is nothing. Understanding the Lord becomes that of love and patience that maketh for the glorifying of that which is the gift of the Father in the material, the mental, and the spiritual world. The way we treat others is the way we treat God. When you're living in a city with five to six million people like we do, there's going to be a propensity for people to get on your nerves, especially if you drive. And once you start to see this, we've got to be cautious about our reactions that we see. It's very easy to be judgmental behind the steering wheel. What in the hell is wrong with him? Why is he driving like that? Give him the business. Do some sign language, right? Check out the electronics on the horn and the lights. Hey, right? But we don't know what that other person's doing. We don't know what they've got going in their lives. We don't know what's driving them. They're driving the way they are for a reason. You're granted safety by having a person go around you. Be thankful and, you know, pray that he doesn't outfly his guardian angels. It's kind of the best we can do, but... We never, never really know what other people are going through. Oftentimes they'll tell you yeah, everything's fine, but it may not be. How can the body attain greater poise and self-control? By becoming less and less selfish and more and more selfless in the desire, in the making of self, the channel of blessings to others, in him in the Christ. In other words, put others before yourself. Selfishness is not a very cut and dried topic. In a lot of ways, it's going to be dependent upon your personal attitudes and beliefs. We could use Paul as an example, Paul, previously known Saul of Taurus, took great pleasure in persecuting Christians back in the day. He was doing it for righteous reasons in his mind. But then, on the road to Damascus, he had to come to Jesus' talk. And then he changed his whole perspective. And he was every bit as ardent about promoting Christianity as he previously was persecuting it. And which was right, which was wrong. At the time, was he sinning? Well, right, but it was righteous in his mind. It was righteous in his mind, perhaps. So it's kind of something that you have to get a grip on yourselves. What do you determine to be right? How are you going to define selfishness? I find myself redefining it all the time because I'm thinking about it. I'm you know, asking about my actions and thoughts and say, well, is that right? Or is that, what, you know, what do I got going here? Because if you don't really think about it, then you're just going to always continue to do what you've always done. You're always going to get what you always got. This is the litmus test. Doth it bring love in any manifested form? This shows as to whether the true knowledge is manifested in the experience of any individual. If it has brought the, not this, if it brings not in thine own experience the fruits of the Spirit, then it is not of God. Are my thoughts, words, and deeds put forth with the intention to manifest love? Or are they not? Why, again, it's the intent 
thing coming back into play. And if you are thinking and speaking and doing things that are of an unloving nature, then understand that the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? You're going to have to learn those lessons. But this is the litmus test both in and out of ourselves. If you're ever, you know, faced with a, a, a choice, there's the question to, to ask. Is it, does it bring forth a manifested love or is it for me personally? Or is that the detriment of another? And when we start to think about this, then we start to change how we are. And then the changes become loving. And we live the fruits of the Spirit. And it is not an easy path. It is a long and winding road full of very narrow pathways and pitfalls. For as Casey tells us, little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little, for the glory of the Father, not the exaltation of thine own self. For with the exaltation of self, or the gratifying the desires of the flesh, the door closes. Because we are here to reestablish our relationship with God. We have a long sordid history of being very self-immersed and self-absorbed beings. We edged God out. We never were companions and co-creators with him. We were all on ourselves doing whatever we wanted to do. Consequently, we need to learn to bring God back into the equation. This is the Old Testament right there. That's your whole Old Testament right there. Because how many times did Israel, not they forget their God and not do it? And what happened to them? They got pounded, right? They got captured. They were in locked up, and they went back into slavery again, time after time after time, right? Why? Because they forgot God. Kind of similar to what we're going down the path today, isn't it? quite possible. Good thing to be old. So when we talk about finding our relationship with God, there's three key things that we need to really know about. We need to be very patient, not only with ourselves, but with others and God and even our surroundings. We need to exhibit self-control. Put others above ourselves. Learn to be selfless. Live the fruits of the Spirit crucify the ego and then we need to know ourselves to be part of the whole and equal to all we are all cut from the same cloth there's no difference in every one of us we need to be companions to God co-creators with God let the mind be the builder these are the steps that we need to start building if we want to actually bring our relationship back quicker Any message for the group as a whole? Answer. As ye have received, as ye are moved, as ye apply that ye receive, give to those that seek. Be patient, be kind. Speak not unkindly of anyone. Let not gossip nor unkind things, either in thought or deed, be in thine experience. And ye will find the true knowledge of the Christ and the Father being close to thee. This is how we come full circle. Because it, we forgot to do these things after we be, got stuck down here. This is how we get out of this mess. We have got to want to do it. And we will be tested and we will be given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. In the Bible, it says, how many times do I forget a, forgive a man's sin? Seven times? And he's, Jesus said, 70 times seven. And that's what it's going to come down to. It's going to be continual. 
And my interpretation of that is that our responses have got to be loving and they have to be automatically loving. We can't, well, you know, think about this a little bit. All right, I'll do it. It's got to be, certainly. How did Jesus, did he ever ponder? Did he ever say, well, you know, you got yourself in that hole, lady. Now what are you going to do? Right? No. What did he say? Go and sin no more. Period. That was the first thing out. That's how we've got to be. And we've got to train ourselves to do this. And it's not easy. And that's how we are. And that is how we overcome the earth and we overcome ourselves. Questions, comments, or insults? <laughs>